Today on Live It Up, we're in Garden City, New York, at the home of Mr. Nelson DeMille. Welcome to the show again. How are you? Very good, Donna. Thank you. So this time we came to you instead of you coming to us right. because I kind of wanted to have time to do a more in-depth uh, yeah. interview with you. Yeah. So we were talking about um, our early days, and I said I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and you grew up in? We're right here on Long Island. Okay. And we were talking about classrooms, and so your early formative um, years as a student, you spent, you said, in the basement, and it wasn't until <laughs> third grade until they let you out. Yeah, so. <laughs> you know, it was uh, post-war, post-war baby boom, and uh, everybody was coming out of the city onto Long Island. My father was a builder with his uh, brother and uh, brother-in-law, and they built 1,500 houses in Elmont, and uh, we lived in one of them. But the schools and everything was overwhelmed. All of a sudden, these families are coming out from Brooklyn and Queens and Manhattan with four or five kids in some cases. So yeah, I, I, you know, I went to a kindergarten and then first, second grade in the uh, basement of a, an old, very old school where they just made room for us. Classrooms were about 30 to 40, 45 kids, uh, but I think I think we were better disciplined then. I think the teachers were able to handle 40 kids. I don't know if they could do that today. Now, um, did they used to like make sure that you had proper handwriting? You know, penmanship? Was that important <laughs> back then? You know? Uh, it probably was, but uh, <laughs> my penmanship is, is, is not very good. I, I do I handwrite all my books. I don't use a typewriter uh, or a computer. But my handwriting is awful. But, I, um, <laughs> but my uh, assistant can read my hand. My, very bad penmanship, and she types it. Uh, I wouldn't send it to the publisher handwritten. Although years ago, if you think about it, before the typewriter, Mark Twain was one of the first American writers to use a typewriter. Before that, the manuscripts were manuscripts. Mm. They went to the publisher went to the, in a handwritten form. They were edited in a handwritten form. Then they went to the printer. It's hard to believe. That, that wasn't is very that hard to believe. Writer, yeah. yeah. Until the 19... Well, turn of the last century, that's the way it was. And so still to this day, you do. You write your books on yellow yeah, legal pads. I do, yeah. Okay. I'm just curious, how many legal pads does it take <laughs> to write a book? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, there's 50 pages to a legal page. I got about 60 words. It's about 3,000. Each pad is about 3,000 words. So 50, 60 pads, something like that. Wow. Maybe. My math is correct. I wasn't good at math either, but, I, <laughs> but, but usually I know I'm, I'm going to burn through 100 to 150 uh, legal pads easily. I think they should brand them. I think it should just say, <laughs> you know, the Nelson DeMille <laughs> you know, official uh, mm -hmm. legal pad, you know? <laughs> well, my, uh, you know, this is so odd to do it, you know, that way. Um, I, um, the Mooga Memorial Library, which was at Boston University, has all my... Uh, archives. They do. They asked me about 15 oh. years ago. So, all well, a lot of my letters and, but all the handwritten manuscripts with all the editing, plus all the type manuscripts with you know hand editing on mm -hmm. them, they're all uh, an archive at the Mooga Memorial Library at Boston University. If anybody ever wants to see them, that's wonderful. Open to the public, and uh, well, some things are sealed until after my death. They let <laughs> you do that. They say okay. You know, yeah. Sealed certain things, and which is what I did, obviously. But uh, people who are scholars, I mean, uh, I don't know why they would want to do this, but some people like to see how the manuscript developed, how it developed from its earliest uh, handwritten notes to its handwritten manuscript, to its type form, and then finally to the galleys. And of course, the galleys are edited, too. Mm -hmm. so there's many, many you know, steps. It takes, you know, it takes about a year, a year and a half to get a book out. And what you see when at the end of the day, uh, which is a nice, nicely printed uh, book form uh, went through you know the processes that are still um, not computerized. It's still the person with the brain and the pencil still has to do it that way. It's very old fashioned up to a point to lead to the technology, the technology part of it, so you know. Well, I think they probably want it to be archived because they want to have that personal connection to you Yep. about like what you were thinking and how do you and it's really yeah. hard to kind of document that process like oh yeah. wait he decided maybe it wasn't going to happen in a cave he changed his mind and it actually yeah. happened on a dock 
you know. Yeah, you know that's the other thing too, because when you when you're using it solely a computer, when you when you're composing on a computer, things are just disappearing that you want to disappear. You're not going to see that. You never see that process. Certainly not going to see a handwritten. You don't even see the old type process where people would cross out and then handwrite something in for the printer. Uh, now it's just you know it could go literally almost right to the printer because it goes to an editor first. Um, and I, you know, people compose on, on the computer. I understand that, and if they can do it, fine. But I still do it the old-fashioned way, which is why it takes me about almost a year and a half to do a book, a little bit more than a year and a half. Um, I've been doing this for 40 years now, and The Cuban Affair is my 20th book. So they're averaging about one every two years. And how did you learn to be a good humorist? How did you learn to write humor? <laughs> I think that I must have, must have been natural. I have no, no, okay. no formal training. <laughs> Most of my, you know, my, my earlier books have a more serious, you know, but uh, one of my earlier books, I, um, uh, I decided I just going to inject some humor into it. Probably it so people work. could breathe, you know, yeah, because it's well, like one of those page turners right. that keeps people up all night and probably you just needed them they, to be like. <gasps> right, what they call comic relief. <laughs> uh, yeah, and what you should do in the movies when you, but I saw that also in a book that some of the characters well, well, the type of characters who are like a uh, NYPD, kind of like that kind of cop humor. Some of my characters were New Yorkers, that kind of New York mouth. Uh, some of my characters were military, and, and the soldiers are very more humorous than we realize. It's sort of like in that world where things are very dire, you need to lighten it up, and, and that's how you survive in either combat or on, on the job as a policeman. So. When I realized that, you know, Americans are humorous, and a lot of books are not showing that humor. So I started putting it in the books. The editors were a little bit concerned, but the fans loved it. So, you know, obviously I did it right. You yeah. did it right. Yeah. Um, when you set out to write a book, yeah. what comes first, the chicken or the egg? So does the, does the climax of what's happening happen first, or do you do it like chronologically in a way. Yeah, I kind of build it kind of chronologically. I mean, you always have to know the opening, obviously. It's, and the ending, you should know what it is because you're trying to work toward it. You don't always know exactly how it's going to end. It's the stuff in the middle that's the problem because you have to get from <laughs> point A to point C. B is in the middle. You know, with TV or even the movies, you got a short time uh, you know, half hour TV show, 90 minute movie, uh, with a book, it's a 16 hour read. And you have to engage the reader the entire way. If you're a viewer of even the longest movie, two hours, uh, you can sit there and you're being entertained or not. But it's finite, but with the book, um, 16, 18 hours of your life is gonna be spent, you know, on this book, so it's sort of like, you have to write it episodically, each chapter. They say leave it with a cliffhanger. Well, yeah. <laughs> you can't always do that, but you should at least leave the end of the chapter with the reader wanting to go on to the next chapter. That's the challenge in this, a in this age of instant gratification, instant uh, entertainment. Um, the challenge is to keep people reading, uh, especially kids with short attention spans. I mean, young kids with my books, but. Mm -hmm that group of 18, 19 college kids, their attention spans are getting shorter and the books are staying the same. There's still 16 hours to read a book. Uh, but when keeping that in mind, you have to kind of segment it. Um, it sounds funny, but shorter paragraphs, shorter chapters, and try to segment that thing as though you're writing a movie with, you know, act one, scene one, scene two, scene three, scene four. Okay. Then the second act, you know, and then which is the middle of the book and then the final act. And if I think, it, my son's a screenwriter, so I learned a lot of this from him. Mm -hmm. Segment it, everything should be the story. <laughs> the arc of the story, right. three acts. Uh, Shakespeare knew this uh, 500 years ago. Um, three distinct segments, beginning, middle, end. Then does he segments. call you on that? Does he say, Dad, you know, I was thinking uh, maybe you might, like, do you guys give each other advice? Like, you yeah, give him does. fatherly yeah. advice and he oh, says, sure. yeah. yeah. I always ask him to read it because he's got a, another kind of um, a way to approach it because he, when he writes screenplays, it's got to be uh, 90 pages, which is very short, but that's a 90-minute movie. 
So there are ways to shortcut things. I used to indulge myself, as every writer did years ago, in longer books. Okay. Uh, more involved with a lot of sedgways and a lot of um, tangential things because it was an entertainment. Um, and, you know, the old Victorian books for people that didn't have radio or TV. Right. In some cases, not even magazines. Uh, the books were like this, War and Peace. And <laughs> that era was, that book was 20 or 30 hours of entertainment. Now we're trying to get it down to telling the same story and telling it well in about maybe 14 or 15 hours of reading. The reader, as opposed to a movie where you're going to watch that thing straight through, some readers will, and you have to you know, realize that one reader is going to take this and read half of it in one night. Another reader is going to read a chapter, put it down, and read it, another chapter, another chapter. Um, it takes some readers a month to finish a book, as we know. It takes other readers a weekend. So when you're writing it, you have to sometimes repeat yourself for that reader that you know hasn't read chapter one for three weeks have gone by. You don't okay. want to repeat yourself too much, but you want to refresh everyone's memory. Interesting. So you kind of yeah. like sprinkle a little bit of the previous chapter to, into right. the next you one. You need to. And you go back to make references again. Okay. To people's names. As opposed to a screenplay, which is straight 90 minutes and, you know, nothing has to be repeated. So it's a different, it's a different discipline. Uh, but, you, but screenwriters can learn a lot from novelists, and novelists can certainly learn a lot from screenwriters. When you were um, learning to read yourself, mm -hmm. who were the favorite authors that you enjoyed reading? Oh gosh, I read uh, when I was a really a little kid. I read something called uh, the I think it was called the Three Peppers. You remember that? Of course, they were Hardy Boys, which is still around, I believe, it's still in print. It was those kinds of series of boys' adventure series. We all read stuff like that, and then uh, of course there was also Disney. Then I, you know, there was some stuff. Some Disney stuff was in print. Okay. But it was mostly those boys' adventure. Then of course the the, the girls had the girls and. The girl Nancy story. Drew, Nancy right, Drew, and the Hardy Boys, right, right. right, and that's what we all read. But it was a, it was, it was as you mentioned, because that was a common experience to the entire country, mm -hmm. from coast to coast. But now, the culture is so fragmented because there's so much available. I mean, you, know, you could probably say that 90% of the girls of my generation read Nancy Drew, and 90% of the boys read the Hardy Boys. But you couldn't say that today about any. Any series, any book, or any this, we have so much available. Well, I just want to point out, though, to you, because you might not even be aware of this, your books unite generations. Well, you know, so, and what I mean by that is that the, you have fans of all different age groups, yeah. you know? And so I think, in a way, you are one of those people that are uniting, you know, the community of readers. Uh, because it has enough for everybody. It's like, yeah. a, it, it relates, it's relatable to people. Yeah, so. ho hopefully, I mean, and I, I don't write, this is, these are not masculine men's books. They seem that way, and some, you know, some earlier covers were more masculine, but fully 50% of my readers are women. Because mm -hmm. we did a market survey some years ago, and I think the publisher was a little surprised too, although I was not, <laughs> to find out about 50% of my readers were women. I get a lot of fan mail through my website, and most of that fan mail is from women. Uh, because women just tend to write more. I understand that they tend to reach out to the author more than men. But maybe 60% of my fan mail is from women. Uh, but, there, but you know, again, the market survey showed about 50 50. Um, and yeah, in different generations, I noticed too. Uh, we also did a survey to see where in the country people read my books, mm. and that, which is kind of interesting. Um, and also the age groups. Um, and college kids seem to like my books because they are a little bit more than action adventure. You know, I was a history major myself, poli sci history. Yeah, poli sci from Hofstra, right? right? From Hofstra. Yeah. I try to put a little <laughs> history in the books and a little background and a little geography. So uh, if you're geographically literate, you'll kind of appreciate some of the. Um, but my, most of my readers seem to be in that kind of middle age group. Um, but now with um, e-books, it's kind of opened it up even more. Because, yeah, you have also, you know, a, right. also talking about technology, don't you have some of the chapters that are on a, on a yeah, disc on also? Yeah, on a disc, right. And uh, there's audio download, 
with the uh, e-books there, you can make it bigger so that older readers can, can read it. So I think e-books, is, and this is, the new technology has kind of opened up the market too to uh, people who also who maybe couldn't afford a hardcover when it came out. And now you can do an e-book, which is much cheaper. Uh, so, you know, are people reading more? No, unfortunately they're not. But, then, but neither are people giving up on reading like you would have thought with all the technology, with all the internet, with all the TV that's available, all the stuff we can watch and listen to without having to read. You would think that readership would be even less. But it's kind of holding steady. Ultimately, people still want to go to a book, sit by themselves quietly and read a book. People have been... Um, uh, predicting the death of the uh, novel right. for about a hundred years now. Well, yeah, I think we're safe. I think, yeah, we're okay. yeah, I think, I think we're we, okay. we still have room for your right. next uh, chapters right. coming out. Yeah. Um, so, what I was surprised about when we were talking off camera is the fact that you finished this book, and I said to you, I said, "Oh, great! You're gonna have a nice Thanksgiving. You can relax now." And you're like, "No, Donna, I'm like, I gotta yeah. write again." Like, right. yeah. so. When do you take? It's a number one pencil you use, not number two, right? Number one, because you can see yeah. it better. A little darker? It's a, little, well, it's a softer lead, yeah, you can okay. see it better. It glides quickly across the, across the page. <laughs> so when you have to sit down and, and you're ready to generate something new, do you sometimes just like write whatever, just to kind of get, get it jump started? Yeah, or? sometimes, you know, you, know, you just want to you wanna jump start the brain and also, you know, the, the, the creative process, I guess, to the extent, you know, but, but why do I get into the next book as soon as I can? Because I want to get into the book uh, so it doesn't become like the term paper that you got the assignment in September and now it's May and you have not <laughs> written word one. So you're not procrastinating. Right? You're, you're a doer. You want to do it. But also you want to see where the book is going. I don't say I, I get into it heavily in the beginning, but I want to get into that book so that if information comes to me, I can get it in the book and want to be thinking in that direction. Um, some novelists, you know, could do a book a year, and others like me take every every two years. But uh, the technology has helped too in terms of you can you can you can when you get it on a computer, you can play with it in the computer. Whereas years ago, you had to cross out and you had the carbon paper and all that. Uh, so it's quicker. The logistics are quicker, and the creative part of it is, is hasn't, hasn't changed. But you have more time to be creative because. At one time, it was just a burden to type a 600-page manuscript on a manual typewriter. Yeah. Believe me, I did it back in the 70s when I first started writing. And I said, this is a tough job. <laughs> it was a physically tough, demanding job. And I used to type myself with the, you know, the typewriter ribbon. Then we went to electric typewriters, and then now we're in um, you know, the word processing and all that. Um, but the idea is to... Uh, if you don't start right away, if you don't start when you finish, you're not going to start for a while. So I finish a book. I know the book is not going to be published for three or four months. The publisher's got work to do on it, and the printer's got work to do. So that's the time. Um, but I, I will take the break, yes. I'll take a, a week or two break. But then I'll get back into it. Okay. And then the book is published, and then I do all the publicity and the promotion so that kind of which is where I am now, and that kind of breaks the writing. You got to stop the writing and and then pick it up again. And this is baby number twenty for you, right? Number twenty, right? Number yeah, twenty. Yeah. It's, it's hard to believe. And um, the first one was by the rivers of Babylon, nineteen seventy-eight. So it's really um, forty, almost forty years. And uh, the next one will be out probably next year, and will be number twenty-one. And uh, um, that will be 22, 23. All my books are still in print, which is terrific. I mean, from 1978. I know. Congratulations you know, on that. That's great. fabulous. And this is, you know, a lot of writers, you know, unfortunately their books have gone out of print. But again, to get back to the technology, because of e-books, all books are in print forever now, for eternity. My books are actually in print in physical books. A lot of writers are unfortunately only in ebooks, but yet they'll be there forever, so their work is available forever. And I think in that way, you've kind of attained some kind of immortality. Because 100 years from now, if all still civilization is still here, 
somebody can just go punch it in and the book will come up, any book that they, they're looking for. Uh, I think it's an amazing thing, and I think, you know, the, the, the future of reading looks good, I think. Um, I noticed that, you know, I sell a lot of audio books, but I, you know, maybe 10% of my sales are audio. So it's not like people want to listen to it. They do, obviously. Some people in the car, they need to listen to it. Well, they have, you know, vision problems. But people would still rather read, and uh, when they have the choice of an audio book, an audio download, uh, or a physical book, or a uh, e-book, people are still mostly going to the physical book, which is, uh, I think, I think it's it's kind of hopeful for the future. You know, my I have a ten-year-old, and uh, we won't let him actually read much on the. Uh, computer, so he's, you know, he's got his books, he's got his library, and he's got hundreds of books, he's a voracious reader. And this is what you have to do, you have to teach him young to... To appreciate to that, appreciate right. The book, open that book up and bury your nose in there, and uh, hopefully that will be a habit that stays with them forever. You had mentioned that your dad's a builder, right? right? Um, and he left a legacy of a building, and it's right. very similar to having a book. It's a yeah. tangible thing like yeah. that that will stay around. When you were um, coming up as a writer, and you and you published that first book, um, were your parents still around, or who were some of your early fans that said, you know what, you did mm. you did oh, well? Sure. Like who was proud of you back well, then? Well, that was back in '78. So it was 40 years ago, and just about everybody from I knew from high school and college in my family was still around. I mean, you know, I got a lot of encouragement. I have to say that. <laughs> but the thing about, you know, uh, writing is the same as acting. You can do it part-time, and I did it in, in, in the early stages before my first book, was, major book, was published in 78. My writing was, you know, kind of kitchen table and a little bit of a hobby. So as long as you don't quit the day job, it's fine, <laughs> you know. But at some point, I did quit the day job, and I said, I'm committed to this. And, uh, my, and I did some paperback novels that did okay, but they weren't, weren't paying the rent. Right. But when my first major book came out in 1978 by the Rivers of Babylon, you know, it was a life changer. It was all of a sudden, this is real <sighs> success. This is not only financial success, but critical success. It's in a hardcover, there's my name, you know. Uh, but from there, a lot of authors, unfortunately, have that they call a second book syndrome. They get too, too self-conscious. They've had a success with the first hardcover they've ever, and now they're getting to the point where they're getting a little gun shy, they're getting a little bit uh, too self-absorbed, or they're afraid to put themselves out there again, especially if the first one was a success. So, but I understood that, and I, you know, and an old editor said to me, uh, told me about second book syndrome, don't let this happen, he said, make believe it's your fourth book. <laughs> make believe it's your first, you know? Yeah, um, that's wonderful advice. That's good advice. And my second book was Cathedral, which was set in St. Patrick's Cathedral, in um, New York City on St. Patrick's Day during the parade. It's about the Irish Republican Army taking over the cathedral during the parade. And another great success, Book of the Month Club made a selection, and, uh, and so on. But I used to see writers around me, you know, older than me have been around. Some of them stayed successful, some of them just faded into oblivion. And um, it's like anything in the arts. This is a tough job. You have to... You're only as good as your last book, and you have to prove yourself every time out. And you can never really just sit back on your laurels because you're asking the public to spend 20 some bucks for a book and take 16 hours of their life and read this thing, and you better give them a good book to make it worthwhile. And I've been fortunate, but I've also, I think, been smart in how to position these books, but also subjects, I always try to pick a subject that's it's got to interest me first, because if I'm not interested while I'm writing it, the reader's definitely not going to be interested. But I try to, you know, and I ask, you know, friends, family about, you know, different subjects or different ideas. Also now with, again, technology with my website, I get lots of email through my website uh, mailbox. And I get ideas from readers, or I get at least suggestions and uh, th or their opinions on certain things. And it's sort of like a, uh, a cheap market survey. I don't have to pay for this market survey. I've got a thousand readers out there, uh, or two thousand every year, sending me uh, emails. So that kind of works too in terms of 
knowing where I'm going. And uh, you got to pay attention to your readers, same as if you were owned a store. You got to pay attention to your customers. Uh, Robert Heinlein, who was a great science fiction writer, once said it was kind of interesting. He said, "As a, as a writer, I'm competing for people's beer money. <laughs> they mm. have a choice. Mm -hmm. They can spend this money there, or they can spend this money here." Uh, so you have to give good value, and I think I've done that over over 20 books. You absolutely have, mm -hmm. and and I like what you said about that. It's true because without the audience, even with me with the show, if nobody's watching, I'd you know, like I, I'm doing it, but I'm really doing it for them, and right. it's really, um, it's an obligation and yeah. also a commitment that you're making to yeah. that other person mm -hmm. that you want to feel that you valued the time that they were honoring yeah, you absolutely. with, and right? The, and you're right, it's an obligation. <laughs> it is an obligation. A lot of writers get a little bit uh, full of themselves. <laughs> and you might know writers like that, I do. And uh, <laughs> they think they're either writing for the ages or they're writing for themselves or they're writing for their favorite editor. But no, 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 they're not. They're writing for the guy or the woman who needs, who has committed to that name, author, and, and the sad thing is some authors, you know, do write good books, but then start to write things that, that become self-indulgent. Well, we um, always say, um, in the Midwest, we were talking about different phrases, too, that people have, and they always just say, don't get above your raising, meaning like, right. you know, like, like don't right. get too high on your horse. Right. Like, you know, just be a regular, just yeah. still stay regular. Like, yeah. be a regular guy. Right. Somebody that somebody would want to have a beer with. Right. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm thinking now of authors I know who, you know, practice that and have been very successful. And other authors who were not happy just being entertainers. They wanted to go to some other level that really nobody really wanted to go <laughs> there with them. Um, and you can write very serious stuff and still be entertaining. Mm -hmm. There's this artificial thing in publishing and in literature that some books are literature, and some books are entertainment. Some are ah. action adventure, but they really could be both. This is what I've always tried to do. Um, some of the stuff that we consider classics today, uh, like Charles Dickens' work, are considered popular entertainment, not worthy of the upper classes in England or America, and now they're considered classics. So, you know, it's not a matter of uh, it's a matter of it's either, it's either boring or it's entertaining. Uh, it's either well written or it's not well written. Um, the artificial uh, genres and subgenres uh, shouldn't exist. Well, I thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure. And I, I love visiting with you. I just do. I find you this completely engaging. Thank you for coming. And I wish you all the best. Oh, thanks so much. Um, and I'm excited. So, number one pencil. Hitting the legal pad soon, right? right? Soon, yeah. Happy journeys <laughs> to you, my friend. Thanks, Donna. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching our portrait here today with Nelson DeMille.